Pete, you can't full top here to just one bet, right? Wrong. Actually, I can. I can do whatever the hell I want. So there. How'd you like those apples? Ladies and gents, today's video is all about finding folds where nobody else does. It's about finding those really cool hero folds that used to be something that we actually bragged about back in the day. I remember when I first started playing cards and the forums that I was in, you know, the online communities that I used at that time. We're watching a, a recorded session here, by the way, not a live one. Would be very in favor of making hero folds. Like almost every day, someone would be posting a hand where they made some absurdly tight looking fold and getting praised by it by everyone else. In fact, it used to be one of the hallmarks of being a good player. These days, in the post-solver era, we are haunted by thoughts like we are so far up our range, if we're folding this, we're folding everything, would Pile Solver fold here, GTO Wizard said it isn't a fold, all of this sort of thing. It's exploitable to fold, all of these thoughts come into it when they didn't used to. We used to have this kind of purism where we only really cared about our EV. You can check out my video on True EV from a couple of weeks ago if, if this is interesting to you, but the True EV of our call against our opponent's actual range in reality. That's the thing we used to care about and that's the thing that we should really get back to. I think we should get back to our roots today and look at our EV against our, our true opponent's range. And yeah, let's make some tight folds. I'm going to show you guys some sort of miraculous folds that you can actually make that can net you a ton of money that I made in a session I just played this morning. Basically, the theme of the session was I got put in spots where I wanted to fold over and over again, so I just did. I just folded over and over again because I was in those spots. Sometimes you have to play along to how poker deals you the cards. You know, it's, it's giving you a session where you just have to be absurdly tight, then you've got to be absurdly tight. So anyway, the first spot that came up was this one. We went ahead and three bet. Ace jack of clubs here, small blind against hijack against a decent reg, I think. Don't know you personally well, Gaz, assuming you're watching because everybody's watching, right? Everyone watches this channel now because it's huge. We, I mean, sometimes we even get over a thousand views for a video. I mean, it's massive. So we go ahead and go for a little block bet there. By the way, if you do like and subscribe to the channel and leave a little comment, it will help us grow. It will help us reach more people and hopefully continue to bring you guys quality content. One third pot. Welsh Gaz goes ahead and thinks and thinks some more and then decides to call. The eight of spades comes on the turn. We can bet small here or we can check. Typically, I would bet small pretty often in the spot. I decided to check this time because the RNG told me to and I hadn't really reached a verdict about whether I thought checking was better than betting here. Like no exploit was jumping off the page at me here, so to speak. So I decided to mix and my RNG gave me a low number to check out our video on how to use RNGs properly that came out last Friday. If you are considering implementing an RNG for the first time, definitely don't try it at home until you've looked at our RNG safety guide. So we do go ahead and check this time. Welsh Gaz goes into the tank once more and then eventually comes out with a rather daunting looking bet. The reason I use the word daunting for this bet is that this is the kind of sizing that sets up an SBR of one. It's a large bet that in essence is going to demote our hand to the status of bluff catcher. When we have a hand that beats all of our opponent's bluffs or is considerably ahead of all of our opponent's bluffs, let's say that, but isn't ahead of any of their value bets, we use the term bluff catcher in the carry poker school and in general it's just a good way of thinking about this mediocre part of our range. What that means is that if our opponent is bluffing optimally, our hand should be very close to break even. In fact, we should already feel completely indifferent here with this bluff catcher against the sizing. Villain's value range is stuff like 8, 7, Ace King that didn't 4 bet preflop sometimes, Ace Queen, Ace Queen with Spade, maybe a hand like 8, 7 suited sometimes as well for value, and then some flushes, and then the bluff region is going to have to be rather creatively crafted. It's going to be things like pocket 9s with a spade, it's going to be things like jack 10 suited which we block, queen jack suited which we block some of the combos of, and things like that. So overall I would expect even a relatively competent human to kind of struggle to bluff optimally in this spot. When I consider me in this spot, and I think of all the strong, you know, two pair plus ace queen plus hands in my range for value here, I begin to wonder like, am I actually bluffing enough in this spot as the hijack player? And I'm not sure that I am. And so because I'm full of myself, I therefore want to accuse all of my opponents of having that same leak of under bluffing as well. So anyway, you may be looking at this thinking, oh my God, did, did you fold here? Did you fold top pair here? Pete, you can't fold top pair to just one bet, right? Wrong, actually I can, I can do whatever the hell I want. So there, how'd you like those apples? Gonna go ahead and fold. Yeah, you got a problem with that? Got a problem with that? Leave it in the chat if you've got a problem with that, yeah? Helps the channel.
Anyway, I'll show you what the solver thinks and then we'll go from there. So we basically told the solver that it had to go ahead and bet all of its range on the flop because that was the strategy I was simplifying to as the small blind here in this 3-bit pot against the hijack, just to remind you of our parameters. Villain goes ahead and makes the call and the 8 of spades rolls off on the turn. As you can see, the solver thinks that checking and betting are the same EV with the age jack of clubs here. Whatever we do, we are entitled to 26.09% pop, which means that our hand is fairly bad already on this node actually. If we put on a little colour view here we'll see that our ace jack that is not a flush is actually orange and orange hands are already kind of struggling to get back much of the pot. That means that if we check and villain checks back we will still be entitled to a fair whack of that pot but when they go ahead and do this guys, when they go ahead and make this very polarised bet and you can see here that there aren't really any hands that okay, maybe like ace-10 once in a blue moon the solver's doing this with, but for the most part, you know, the only weaker ace-x that's doing this is uh, actually spades, which is the flush, which isn't weaker ace-x at all, and then the solver is having to having to craft bluffs with like the king-jack of diamonds has begun bluffing here, begun making this weird hybrid play. The king-10 of clubs is betting here all the time. Tens with a spade is always betting. Jacks with a spade is betting often. Queens with a spade is doing some betting. I just expect pool to be way more passive than this, guys. Way, way more placid. Ace King is in there really frequently for value. There's ace queen value bets, there's flush value bets, you know. This is just a spot where we're going to underperform if we call. So what does the solver think about folding? How big a deviation was it for me to make this miraculous, crazy hero fold? How big a deviation? What do you think? Well, the solver says that we should fold. The solver says, and I'm not bragging here, I'm not being like, Oh, look at me, I'm, I'm very close to the solver. Ah, thank you, solver daddy, thank you for the validation. Yes, yes, quite. I'm not doing that. I'm not looking to solver daddy for validation here. I don't have those kind of issues, guys. I mean, no offense to anyone that has those kind of issues, needs a pat on the head from Pile Solver. We've all been there, right? We've all had low moments where we're like clinging onto it like a rock in a storm when we're lost at sea. But we don't have to be that way with the solver. We can be like, okay, solver, you're making up your mind based on the parameters of your world. My world is different to your world, so I'm gonna go ahead and say that actually, if you think it's slightly microscopically irrelevantly losing, for me to call a stack of clubs look at EV, it's 0.2% pot negative. That's nothing, it's basically break even. But because we look at their strategy and we think they're gonna underbluff this spot so heavily, we think that they're going to miss the bet frequency they need to have with jacks, tens, nines with a spade, jack ten, weirdo kamikaze bets with king ten because Solver's so clever, Solver can do what it wants, Solver gonna get you. Humans aren't doing that, right? I, I don't even think like a strong reg understands that like king ten of hearts is a bet here. Like what? What? Solver is insane. So given that humans are not insane and they're not like completely diabolically off their faces all the time on some kind of GTO drugs, they're not going to do that. And therefore, this fold is actually going to be very good. So let's let's just watch this. Just watch this. This might trigger a reaction in you, you know, where you're like, this ain't OK. You can't do that. Like what I did here, you can't do. But you can. You can honestly do what you want. Don't let them tell you what to do. Here's another big fallacy when people say, you're too far up your range. You're too far up your range to fold here, son. What do they mean by that? It's some kind of weirdo, like, absolute hand strength judgment, like, because I have top pair, I just can't fold because that's more important than a systematic, analytical thought process that goes through the positions, the action sequence, the texture, the ranges. Apparently none of that matters, according to these people, because I have top pair, I have to call. Problem. Big problem. So don't be like these bozos, don't be like looking at some random absolute hand strength label and condemning people who fold here. You're allowed to hero fold and this ain't even a hero fold in theory, but there's a lot of people I know that are decent poker players that would never fold this spot because they are slaves to these labels and that's a real shame guys. So let's break free from the shackles of not folding and feel free to fold if we want to fold. I had a distinct, clear feeling in my gut here that calling was losing and I was right actually because when you look at the solver it does seem to point in that direction. So be careful, listen to your gut. You know when people are under bluffing in your games. Don't listen to the solver, don't listen to the people who judge you based on arbitrary labels. Anyway, enough of that rant, let's do another spot. So this hand has absolutely nothing to do with folding, but I want to show you it anyway, as I was skipping through the footage, because it's kind of cool. Blind versus blind, we are meant to mix bet and check on the swap. I would just use a big bet here when I'm betting, I'm betting really, really strong value hands and bluffs. My value range is going to determine my sizing. 
check again on the turn. Now, most people would always bet here, but in fact, in GTO, this is still a mix. Like, villain is meant to be trapping you sometimes, check raising you. This is a good player. If you're a 5 NL grinder and you step up to 200 NL because you're drunk and it's a Saturday night and your other half is a way out for a night out with their friends and you're, a, you're home alone with a pizza and, and too much too much whiskey and you've moved up in stakes, you know, eight times, just don't feel like you have to bet here. People will trap you here. You want to protect your check and range, you can check back. Although I think if you're playing against like a fish at 5 NL, you should probably just bet turn and the river. But anyway, I check back. I'm not playing against such a player, unfortunately. And then on the river, they block bet. So there's two things I do here that none of you will ever do watching this because you guys aren't, you know, poker gods like me, sorry. The first thing I would do that you wouldn't do is reach this spot with this hand. And the next thing I would do that you probably wouldn't do is make this raise. And the reason you wouldn't make this raise is that you'd be like, oh no, oh no. But you don't have to be that way. I'm just messing, guys. I'm in a very playful mood today. So sometimes when I'm in a playful mood, I, I say come across really disrespectful, but it's just me having fun. What I really mean is that most people don't raise the river with this hand at low stakes and micro stakes because they don't understand that the villain, their value range in this situation is actually like capped at bad king, good jack, mostly. Okay, they can have some very weird hands like pocket eights here maybe that like blocks your calling range or something and is therefore relying on inducing raises and things like that. But in equilibrium, in theory, like there's just not a lot of hands that you lose to here. So that means you have like 85% equity with this hand and you need to raise. Long story short, there's just two things you can do better if you're playing against a strong player. One is reach the spot with this hand sometimes, and two is actually raise the river when you do. And that's how you avoid some of the very obvious imbalances that your colleagues at 2NL, 1NL, 0.5NL are making. On all the way up to 50 and 100 NL as well. Boom, got them. Not really. Guys. Watching a Carrot Poker School training video is like getting an elite academic education in cash game poker that you simply cannot get anywhere else. If studying poker was like studying, say, law for instance, then choosing the Carrot Poker School would be like getting into the top law school in the country. Imagine getting 33 lectures from such an establishment for less than a thousand pounds. Most poker players struggle because they simply lack the theory necessary to understand the mechanics of this complex game properly. They get disorganized, random content, and rely on the advice of peers in study groups and forums who are also struggling. The Carrot Poker School gives you all of the material you need to achieve your wildest poker dreams. The rest is up to you. To pick up the Carrot Poker School today, click the top link in the description, head on over to carrotcorner.com, Add it to your cart, go to checkout, make a payment, and you are done within 10 seconds. You can then download all of our videos and get ready to start your full scholarship. Let's get back to the action. So there's more spots in this video that are really cool as well, where I think folding is just a really nice thing to do. Oh, this is a cool thin value bet though. I will show you this one because this is actually really interesting, right? Villain goes ahead and donks the flop. Like talk about how to play against weak players. This is handling weak players 101. It's actually rather enticing to raise here for one key reason. This range is actually quite merged. Sometimes I've asked students, like, what do you think of the range that like bombs out like this? And they say, oh, it's polar. It's not actually polar. It's actually very merged. Villain will do this with one pair. He'll do it with draws. He'll do it with an eight. He'll do it with a seven. The reason I decided not to raise here is that I'm in position and the SBR is like really low as well. And like, I can just get the money in later anyway on most runouts, not all runouts. There are some runouts that kill action here though. So I think raise is actually a pretty decent play in this spot, even though SBR wise, urgency wise, game theory wise, we don't need to raise here. I think we can in reality with a hand like this and perhaps should actually. I decide just to call because I'm in that mode where I'm like, I'm going to trap you. And it is a balance because if this guy is a maniac that's leading like random stuff, then call is by far the best play on the flop. Raising is a mistake. But there aren't that many people that just randomly lead out 66% pot with random stuff here. Usually it's a sign that the recreational player has something. When they check river, I think this range is really underprotected. Sometimes they'll have some random hand like two pair that beats us, but this is kind of a mandatory value bet because now I think most of their range is mergey stuff like ace x essentially. So here I decide to make a bet because I think my equity is about 80% and I make a bet that is like decent for that amount of equity and villain calls with like ace three or something and that's the end of that one. The lesson of this hand is just a really quick one and it is do not ever fold ever 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 against random recreational players that you don't know because they will do really really dumb shit. That's the lesson. Let me show you. So we decide to check this time. I should actually bet here this was a lapse in concentration. I was basically kicking back in my chair and I was like, oh yes, I'll bet my range. Uh, see, 40% of time and I will bet hand 55% of time. And I was sitting back in my chair doing this thinking, I'm so clever. Look at me coming up with frequencies and 
I forgot that like my opponent's an unknown and many unknowns are recreational players at this time in the morning because I've seen all the regs that sit there and just grind all day, you know, earning their daily bread. I've seen all those guys, I know who they are, they've got orange tags. This is probably a fish, forgive me for saying that on PC term, and against a weaker player, against a recreational player, a fun player, a businessman or woman, what we want to do is go ahead and bet the flop. And the reason for that is that if you check, you're going to get randomly bet at for no reason all the time, and it's going to suck for a hand like Jack-9 that's got some stuff going on but not quite enough to defend. So remember that pattern if you want to make a lot of money, bet the semi-hopeless trash in your range on the flop against a random weaker player, yeah? Then on the turn, we go ahead and block bet, which is a fine, fine play. I mean, you can't have anything against block bet here. You can also check here, and that's totally fine. You can do either one of these two plays. I don't really care. On the river, you can probably block like quarter pot or you can check. You can maybe block third pot here as well, actually, because it is blind versus blind, though this card is very wet. I decided to check, which I think is all right. I think block bet's probably overfolded too a little bit on this node, and therefore it's going to hurt us a bit. So we check, and the river, we hope it goes check, check, but it doesn't. Villain goes ahead and makes some weird small bet, which looks like, like in the hands of a 50NL reg that's just like really straightforward and has never made a cool play in his life. I would say that this is just basically always a 10 that's like, oh, I'm targeting a 9! And that's often how people will think they'll use the word targeting and they'll do If you use targeting, by the way, guys, you need to take a good look at yourself in the mirror. Like, I want you to look in the mirror tomorrow morning when you wake up and say, why am I saying targeting? One, I don't actually know what my opponent, what sizes my opponent will call with the region that I'm targeting. Two, I'm completely ignoring the rest of the stuff in their range when I'm targeting that one region. And three, just who do I think I am thinking in these terms? Like, what, what am I doing using a banned term from the Carrot Poker Discord? What am I doing? We've banned that term for a reason. I even told one of my coaches he couldn't teach students it the other day. I'm that much of an authoritarian dictator. Targeting is, is not great. And the reason it's not great is that it makes you think about tiny parts of the game tree. It makes you make things up, make assumptive claims. It's just, just nonsense. In any case, that would be what I would think of the range of a, a regular who did this. But actually, what I think this is, is random. Random. Sometimes this player will have a five. Yes, you heard it here first. They will have an eight. They will have eight, seven. They will have ace, queen of clubs and think that this is a bluff. They will do things like this. And because of that, we should just call. Like, forget the fact that there's a certain type of net reg that underbluffs this spot against the recreational. I was actually close to folding here because for some reason, in my brain, I was like, this is a reg. He has a 10. And I was like, hold on a minute. Like, what am I talking about? I don't know this player. Look at me almost folding, almost making a terrible fold. There's the art of folding, then there's the art of not making terrible folds. So this would be a terrible fold against an unknown. We need to win like 22% of the time. Like, what are we doing here? Not even. We need to win like 19% of the time. I can't do math today. My god. Like, why are you making this so hard, Pete? Just call. Like, finally, yay, we get there. He has 6 5 off the point stance. These people do random shit. Back to a spot where folding is cool. Let's go to another one. So, this is a spot where villain is probably a bad player. Probably. I mean, maybe. Lowercase name lots of numbers like there were another like 9318 stands before this guy and then he still used an underscore so you know not really too impressed so far so we can we can race here against someone that's just lazily betting range we can but we decide to call the turn is a six and this is absolutely not a spot you want to overbet in gto like if you want to copy a solver and you've seen solvers overbetting so therefore you overbet this is not the spot to do it my friend and the reason for that is that the nut advantage here is completely equalized not completely but we have tons of spade spade, we have tons of 9-7, we have tons of that, what's the other straight? 7-4, yeah, we even have that one. We have pocket 6s, 8 6 king 6 6 5. We just have so many nutty hands here, and that's why overbet just causes a really quick split in our range where we're suddenly just continuing. Really strong, folding all the other stuff, like 8-4 suited, yeah, because we play that, because we're like that. Queen 8 of diamonds, there we go. Snap fold to this with Queen 8 of diamonds, it's not indifferent, it was indifferent to a lesser sizing. So this, this sizing overpays to make our range indifferent. Our range is too polar for this sizing to be good against us. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's okay. Don't worry about it. You can't learn poker in a day. If you do know what I'm talking about, well done. Give yourself a hearty pat on the head. So I decided to fold here because I think that to a normal bet size, this would be a call. We have an open ender and a pair. But anybody who's doing this, I don't think they're going to be balanced. They're not going to be very good at range construction. I don't think they're going to find the bluffs particularly well. I think it's very likely that such a player is just going to have flushes a lot, value hands a lot, sets a lot. So I just uh, opted to fold here. I think it's maybe a slight deviation, but I'm not sure how big a deviation because I have never once studied facing an overbet on this card because nobody does it because it's just odd. It's just frankly odd. 
that's the kind of fold that you want to make when people basically paint themselves as weak players and then take a line that's going to be under bluffed by a weak player then line equals player type equals read on line equals fold i want to show you this hand as well it's, again it's not about folding not everything in this video will be about folding but this is about capitalizing on fold equity it's actually about the other side of the coin so this is a bit loose, but I think against a recreational player, short stack, blah, 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 we can make this work. So we decide to call using the skill legend. Arrogance, using your own arrogance as a reason to call pre is a solid move that pros use all the time. We decide to take this line, which is not a thing in GTO. Like GTO, if you if you run this in a solver, it's going to be like, oh, what are you doing, you idiot? This is a check fold. And it is. So before you guys pile onto this comment section, please do come into the comment section. Even if you want to criticize, it's fine. Please do leave comments. But before you do that, and before you go, oh, you idiot, the solver never take this line. Oh, what are you doing? Why would you make such spewy bluff, huh? It's exploitative. It's exploitative, okay? It's not meant to be some solver approved line. The idea is that villain's range is way too capped and we're gonna create a funnel of punishment for villain. We're going to build a funnel of punishment and his range is gonna fall into it and then get exploited through our exploit factory that we're building here with this bet. And the idea is that now their range is just gonna to be too capped, too weak, too much ace king, too much pocket pair, too much eights, too much sevens, that sort of thing. Oh, but you block sixes? I don't care. And then we're gonna bomb the river, right? We're gonna go boofed. Overbet, but slight overbet because like the recreational player will react to usually not always but almost always will react to 1.5x pot and 1.2x pot in exactly the same way. So why even bother going bigger than this? Someone pulled me up for using too big of an overbet against a recreational player in a previous video, and they were absolutely right. They were absolutely right. So yeah, obviously they fold because obviously their range is way too capped and weak, and they're always folding. We have a hundred percent fold equity with that bet. Not really. This is the other hand I wanted to show you. So we flat jacks on the button, no three bet. Why would we not 3-bet? Because it's fine to flat, that's why. And this guy squeezes, this guy is about to call, and then we're gonna call. I mean, pretty standard preflop, not a lot to say. Let's skip forward, call, call. 8 5, 10. starts with a check from the preflop raiser. This guy goes ahead and bets, which is already kind of like, uh, are they gonna bluff enough here three-way? Are they gonna find enough bluffs without their king-queen, etc.? I'm not sure. I do reluctantly call, I'm not folding yet, I need like 20% pot share, and clearly my hand is worth 20% of the pot. It's not worth more than about 30% of the pot, but it's clearly worth like 20% of the pot. Then the six comes on the turn, we're already like gearing up the bow and arrow of folding here, and we're getting ready to fire this fold out at people. If this guy bombs here, like I'm just snap folding, like there's no way I'm remotely interested, because even if Pile Solver is like, okay, you should, you should bluff catch with this hand sometimes, and I probably won't say that actually, because this configuration is just way too scary and way too tight now. And actually, I think this spot is an incredibly easy fold. I think for anybody that's beating like 25 at L, this fold should be second nature. Like you shouldn't even be thinking twice about it. If you call here to this jam, you are probably a very losing poker player. That would be my honest, honest opinion. Because calling in this spot is like setting money on fire. It's like taking a lighter to a hundred bucks. 200 bucks actually because it's 200 NL and just torching it all because this range is going to be set so it's going to be queens at minimum sometimes it will be like king queen of spades but even if you get lucky and you run into exactly king queen of spades bearing in mind you block king jack and ace jack of spades and queen jack of spades and then this range wakes up with like sixes or fives or eights or tens or something or aces and decides to call you still lose you still have no equity, so very easy fold. But the thing here for the beginners out there, I'm talking more to the novices, I know the more advanced people watching this will know that this is a fold. If you're not sure this is a fold, just remember, it's your relative hand strength that matters. So the fact that you have an overpair is very much an irrelevant label. It doesn't matter anymore. It's like if someone told you to make a list of all of the red things in the room and if you could name them all, you won a prize. It wouldn't matter that this was a mug, right? The fact that it's red is what's important, right? In this context and here, it's your equity that matters. It's your equity that's actually the salient data point and not whether your hand is overpair. Overpair is an arbitrary label that can get you into a lot of trouble. Anyway, I'm going to wrap it up there. We do fold this spot. Hope you guys have enjoyed this video and you've taken a lot from it. I wanted to show you a few cool plays that came up. I also just wanted to show you that folding is not dead. Folding is really cool. And yeah, you know what to do. If you enjoyed this video, click the top link in the comments. I'll take you to our Carrot Poker School page. You can check out our course. And yeah, the link is in the description. There's other links in there as well that you can click. This has been Pete. I will see you guys on another video very soon. Don't forget to like the video, to leave a comment and do subscribe so you get notified when our videos come out. Much love. Bye for now. Peace out. Bye-bye.